All right, let's get started. Welcome back, everyone, to another exciting day of CS 107, end of week two here, which is, uh, I don't know if that's moving quickly or slowly for you, but whatever the case may be, hopefully it's all, it's all, it's all going. Uh, a couple announcements before we get into lecture today. The first one, the first couple are things that have already happened. The first being that labs hopefully all happened this week. Hopefully you all enjoyed that, that process of working through C strings, a little bit of GDB, just seeing generally how to work with C and work with, with pointers. The other thing I just want to mention briefly is that assignment zero grades went out a couple of nights ago. So um, we made a post about that with the, the medians. Um, if you want to review your grades at any point throughout the quarter, you can go to the gradebook link on the course website. That'll show you your assignment scores, but also your lab attendance. Note that the lab attendance will not show up until the end of the week. We'll probably post it around Saturday. So it, don't worry if you, you know, just went to lab and you're like, oh gosh, it's not showing up. Um, don't worry. If, if the the, the rule of thumb is if the grade, if the, there is no line for that assignment or lab in the grade book, that means we haven't posted anything yet. Um, so don't, don't panic if you don't see a recent assignment or lab. Big thing to note, of course, uh, coming up is that assignment one is due on Monday, this coming Monday. That is the sort of normal deadline for that assignment. Please check out our late policy if you have any questions about how our deadlines and hard deadlines work. Uh, I realize, we realize that the, the late policy is maybe a little different than what you might be used to from other CS classes, so just, just watch that and be, be aware of that. All right. Okay, let's, let's get into it. Here's what we have on deck for today's lecture. So last time we ended with a discussion about arrays. We saw how to allocate arrays on the heap. We talked a little bit about how to allocate them on the stack. And then we saw lots more with arrays and in particular with C strings uh, in lab this week. So we're gonna pick up where we left off from that and we're gonna Go back to this question, which has come up a few times in Piazza and in office hours already, which is when exactly do we use the stack versus the heap? Why should I prefer one form of memory allocation over the other? Then we'll look at somewhat briefly at a, another common example of how pointers can be used, which is to pass variables by reference. So you may recall from C++ that there was some special syntax that allowed you to say that a variable was passed by reference. In C, we don't have that syntax, so what do we do instead? And then the main part of the, of the class today is going to be working through some pointer code examples. We'll be mostly on the terminal, but then I'll switch back to the slides at the end to draw out a couple more pointer diagrams. And the intention here is, we worked through a bunch of stuff on Monday. We saw some good examples of you know, how, to, how pointers work, how some of the operations work. We saw the pictures for that. And now our goal is, well, how does this actually translate to the code that we're writing? How do we actually, how does it, man how do these, for example, how do memory errors and sort of the common issues that we were discussing last time show up in our code, whether that be in our output or how do we debug it? How do we look at, how do we use something like GDB or Valgrind to make sense of something that is going wrong in our memory? So we'll sort of, sort of switch between code and slides as a way to, to, to work some of that out. All right. <clears throat> okay, so let's get into it with a somewhat condensed discussion of stack versus heap. We've, we've certainly talked about this on, um, on, on Piazza, and there's some stuff in the assignment one handout and advice page about it um, to look into it. But uh, here's, here's the rundown. So we, we saw two different ways to allocate an array. And I'll, I'll be focusing on arrays because those are the, by far the most common cases where we need to think about 
using the stack or the heap. We saw two ways to allocate an array. One of them was to say int array bracket five, which declares the memory on the stack. One of them was to say to declare an int star and have it point to a malloc. Right. With the stack, there's there are some pretty compelling advantages, and by far the biggest of them is that the memory is automatically cleaned up for us. We don't need to call free. We don't need to remember to, you know, clean anything up. Once the function returns, the memory associated with ARR is just is just taken care of, and program continues to run. No memory leaks. No memory errors. That's that's really nice. Another advantage that we started to talk a little bit about in assignment one is that the stack um, is considered really efficient. What this is saying is, now you, might, you might be thinking from when you think about efficiency from the perspective of CS106, for example, and thinking of like big O runtime and asking, well, wait, are you saying that the heap runs in something that's not constant time? Like, is the heap running in, in some crazy linear time? What, what's the factor? It's, it's not quite that. Uh, both the stack, both allocating on the stack and the heap are largely constant time, but the constants are very, very different. So if we were to have, for instance, a malloc inside of a loop that was running for 100,000, a million, 100 million iterations, we'd start to notice that the program would slow down a little bit. Whereas if we had been doing exactly the same loop with a stack array, way, way faster. So in general, the rule of thumb is use the stack when you can. Uh, if, if there is a, a good, like, you don't need a good reason to use the stack. That should sort of be your default go-to. But there are a couple reasons that you might need to use the heap. We already saw um, a couple in um, throughout, which is that the big one, of course, being controlling, we need to control the, run uh, the lifetime of the variable that we allocate. So for, in, for instance, in read frag in the starter code for assignment one, we can read the, the fragment into, into memory, but then we need the fragment to stick around until after we have reassembled everything. So it would be a huge problem if the memory were deallocated at the end of read frag. Therefore, have to use the heap. Another advantage that we won't talk too much about in lecture is that the heap uh, memory can be resized, so there is this function called realloc. I encourage you to take a take a look at it. It should be in K and R. You can look at the man pages, but essentially it lets me say, actually, I know I asked for five ints of worth of space, but I actually need ten, or I actually need twenty, and we can use that that structure to build these kind of automatically expanding uh, blocks of memory. In contrast, if I say int array bracket five, that's it. You can't say, oh, just kidding, I need five more. Can't do it. You won't be able to extend this array. Okay. <coughs> Questions about stack versus heap? Question. Um, yep. So when you have a stack array, um, is it possible to use a variable as the length of the array of C? Is it possible to say that again? Is it possible to use a variable as the length of a stack array in C? What do you mean use a variable as the length? Of the so say I have like int x equals like five, and then I want to do int r of x. Oh, so you're asking whether it's possible to declare an array, and instead of putting five in here, you want to put the name of a variable in here? Yes. Um, this is a somewhat new, and when we say somewhat new in C, we mean 1999, which is not at all somewhat new for, in some sense. But uh, a rel it, it was a, in addition to the language after, after C happened, which is that we can declare an array with a variable length here. Um, that doesn't mean we can resize it, right? It, the, even if the variable changes, the array will not resize. Um, it'll be whatever size it was when you declared it. We'll actually see an example of, of this showing up later in today's lecture. So yes, that is possible. Anything else? Okay. Great. So let's get into the actual, actual coding part um, to, do, to do the first part of this. Uh, the code, as, last, as it was last time, is in the is in the class directory. If you want to follow along, that's fine. If you want to just watch me do it, that's also fine. Uh, I have my normal two terminal setup here. So let me just let me just get into it. We have two programs that we will be working on today. Uh, one of them is a pretty short program called ref.c, which I'm going to use to show 
as my reference. And then the bulk of the lecture will be in this cster.c file. So let's start off with ref.c. Ref I'll come over here. I'll pull it up in the editor. And you can see what's happening in this code. Let me walk you through briefly what I'm trying to show here. We have a function called change. And what we'd like this function to do is that we would like it to take a parameter into x, and we would like it to change the value of x so that when we come back to main, the value of, in this case, you know, the value has been increased by 10. In this case, we start with the variable num, which starts with the value 107, and we call change of num, and we were, were hoping that after calling change, the value of num down here will be 117. So that's what we'd like to happen. Uh, you may get a sense from how I'm presenting this that that is not what will actually happen. So I've already made, as it turns out, so I'll just go ahead and run it. But well, well, you can, we can make again just in case. Okay, it tells us that it's up to date, which means that I did already make it, so that's great. And sure enough, we see that it didn't work. Not the way we wanted. So inside of change, after we call, after we say x plus equals 10, we do not get, uh, we, we do get the updated value, but then once change returns, the value has gone back to 107. You probably saw this scattered throughout, there were definitely some Piazza posts talking about pass by reference versus pass by value, and that's exactly what we're getting at here, which is that in C, just like in C++ and Java, at least by default, variables are passed by value. What does it mean to pass a variable by value? It means that when I call change of num down here, the value of num, 107, is copied into x, so that changes to x will have no effect on the on the calling functions variable, okay? So what do we do? Well, like I said, in C++, we have some special syntax for this. Uh, yeah, no, no such luck in C. We've gotta do it with pointers. So how does that look? And I'll just kind of show you what the changes are and we can kind of talk about why this, what this is, what we're getting at. So I'll start with main. Rather than call change of num, which will pass the actual value 107 to the change function. I want to give the change function the address. I want to say, rather than here's the number, go do something with it, I want to say, here is a location where one of my variables is. You can read the number out of that location, or you can go to that location and change that value. And the way I'll do that is throw an ampersand on it. So change of address of num will now give the change function a pointer to, so this passes an address, which means that the parameter is of type int star, it's a pointer to the int. I'm gonna rename it to p to remind myself that this is not just some variable, some integer variable anymore, this really is a pointer. And now I can use this pointer to read and write the value of the int. Now in C++, that might have been it. We just changed the prototype and that was, we were done. Not quite anymore in C, we have to actually be explicit about the fact that we have changed, uh, with the fact that we have changed from taking in an integer to taking in an int star, which means that everywhere in the code for change, I need to dereference P in order to read or write the value. So here I would say star p plus equals 10, which means follow this pointer, go to the integer that's at the other end of that arrow, and change that number to be 10 larger. Likewise, when I print, same rule applies, star p. I'll save, I'll make, I'm only gonna make ref, I guess it doesn't matter. Yeah, I'll only make ref because I don't wanna, I don't wanna build cster right now. Um, I can run it, and we see that it did work. So just an example of how we can use pointers to do something that C++ gave us syntax for. Um, also just a good opportunity to review stars and ampersands. Any issues about this? Any questions about these changes? Okay. 
So this might come up in assignment one in case you found yourself in a situation where you said, oh, you know, I'd really love to, um, I'd really love to have a function that, say, returns two different values. Um, maybe I want a function that returns an int but also updates another, another variable. This is how you're going to do it. You're going to pass a pointer. In that case, let's move on to the, to the bigger example for today. I'll pull up cster.c. Hmm? Okay. Right. This block of code is, there's quite a lot of code going on in here. Uh, it's probably one of the biggest examples that we've, we've looked at. So I'll go through it piece by piece. I'll talk you through what the, what the core ideas are, and then we'll explore each of these functions in turn. So first, let me go over the, the main function. Okay. You can see here, so we're gonna do a bunch of stuff with C strings. Hopefully you, you know, are feeling all right about C strings from lab. If you're not feeling totally on, on board with it yet, that's okay. There's plenty of time to fill in those, fill in those gaps today, but, um, but we'll also we'll just spend some more time doing, doing some string examples. So here you can see I've declared three different strings, and I've declared them in different ways. I have one that is declared on the stack, cleverly named stack. I have one that is declared with malloc on the heap, cleverly named heap. And I have one which I initialized down here to be a string constant or string literal. They, we're, we're probably gonna use them interchangeably. Um, and so this is, uh, yeah. And our goal for this function or for this program, is that we would like to take each of these strings, which each have kind of wacky capitalization, and I would like to explore different ways of converting the string to lowercase. So I've got six different variants of lowercase that we can, we can look at here. Um, and so what we're gonna do is we're gonna call lowercase on each of these, each of these strings, and then we're gonna print out the value to see how it goes. Okay? So let me go up to lowercase one. At some point I'm gonna start scrolling. And I, I've, I left all the, there's some good comments in here explaining what each of these functions does. Uh, in case you, know, you wanna look back at this code later, um, it'll talk you through some of the, some of the bugs and stuff, but, but we'll talk through it all together um, today. So here's the first variant. This is lowercase one. And what we're doing here is, well, here's the simplest way we could possibly convert a string to lowercase. You got a char star, okay, go through all the characters, change them all to lowercase. This is pretty nice. There's no memory allocation, there's no copying, there's no, you know, it's a super efficient process. Um, and, you know, it has the up or downside, depending on what your situation is, of changing the string in place. So whatever the original string was, it will, that string will now be lowercase. Okay? Uh, question about the code, yeah? Is it necessary to replace the string, or can you just say return to the body? Oh, good question, yeah. So, um, so you're asking if it's necessary to return str here, seeing as we didn't change it. Yeah. Uh, it is not. However, because all the, some of the later ones do need to make a copy, that's, that's kind of why that's there. There are a couple of, yeah, so there are a couple of places where the return is pretty much uh, in, in, unimportant. Um, but I'm just keeping the prototypes the same. But that's, that's a great point. That in this case, the return value is totally pointless. Cool. Anything else about the code? Just a quick thing to draw your attention to. We've got the for loop from i equals zero up to, but not including sterlen. Pretty standard um, string loop. Maybe there's some little bit of, yeah. Okay. All right, let's try it. So I'm running this function on stack, on heap, and on constant. Right? Um, that's what we had down there in main. Let me just remind you of that. I won't keep jumping around too much, but stack, heap, constant. Let's see how it goes. Ready? So I don't have to, I don't think I have to make because I think I've already done. Great. I'm going to run cster. Oh, bummer. Okay. We get a seg fault. Uh, now what? I mean, I wrote this 100, 100 line piece of code. Like, what do I do? Well, Maybe your first reaction, which would be a pretty good one, if this was your first reaction, 
you should uh, be proud of yourself, is to drop into GDB and see if we can get GDB to tell us where exactly we seg faulted. So here we are in GDB. I can run the program, no arguments, and we see that we seg faulted inside of lowercase one, that seems okay, sure, uh, on the string junior. Now, if you can't remember what the string junior was, whether that was stack, heap, or constant, we could use the, so we're in lowercase one. If I do a backtrace, we can see that lowercase one was called by main. So if I want to go back and look at what line of main called lowercase one, I can use the up command to bring me up here. And here I see that the problem was in calling lowercase one on constant. So presumably we got through the stack one, we got through the heap one, and now we're stuck at this one. The reason being, string constants cannot be changed. So we had char star constant equals, equals junior, and that'll work, and we can use constant just like any other string, except we cannot change the characters inside of it. Okay? And the reason for that is you might ask, well, where, where is it stored? Is it stored on the stack? Is it stored on the heap? Because I thought I could change both of those. Yeah, it's not stored in either of them. It's stored somewhere else called read-only data. That just happens to be the place where you put string constants, and that place happens to be read-only because, because you probably don't want to be changing these strings um, ostensibly anyway, because that could actually have weird impacts on the rest of your program. So the operating system just says, no, forget it. Now, I'd, maybe a quick note here about the seg fault. Up until now, we've been talking about seg fault as if it were this, like, Oh, you accessed memory that didn't exist. You dereferenced null. You dereferenced uh, garbage memory in uninitialized variable. Um, this seg fault is a slightly different one, which is that you'll notice that the string is totally valid. The memory for str is, is entirely there, and we can be reading from it. The seg fault is happening actually because of the equal sign, because we're trying to assign back to it. So a seg fault need not just be invalid memory. It could also be the memory is not writable, but you tried to write to it. And no, you can't really tell the difference. Okay. Questions about this so far? All right, so I will comment out, um, I'll comment out result three so it doesn't say fault, just so I can show you the rest of it. Uh, I'll just say result three equals quote, quote, just so I can have something to print out. Just do empty string. We'll make. Um, there are a couple of warnings. You'll notice these warnings are happening in lowercase two and three. So I will get to those warnings in a moment. But I'll run cster, and we can see that without the constant thing, so I've, I've, I've done nothing for the constant, but without that one, the stack and the heap both work. Very important thing to note from this, this, this line though, stack and heap themselves have both been changed. So it's not just that the result is lowercase, but also the original strings as well. This should not surprise you. We talked about this being our goal of modifying the strings in place. Okay, questions about lowercase one? All right. Okay, let me switch to lowercase two. And I just have to remember to go all the way down and do this. Or I can use clever Vim tricks. But, okay. I'll save. I'll go down to, yep. Wouldn't you be able to like access um, characters in the constant string by doing like constant bracket one or two? Like, is it the same in that oh, sense? Yes, it is, absolutely. So you're asking, so the question is, can we use, um, by the way, I guess SCPD is asking me to repeat the question, so that's why I'm doing that, not because of anything else. Um, the, you can absolutely, down here, say constant bracket i. Um, it works exactly the same way as any other care star. In fact, looking at the declarations for heap and constant, if, you know, I wouldn't be able to tell the difference, right? They both work like care stars, they both have array indexing, um, it's just that you cannot say constant bracket one equals some character and expect that to work. 
All right, so here's lowercase two. I have pretty much point out the bug even. Okay, so we decide, all right, well, that lowercase one, that was pretty nice. It worked for stack and it worked for heap, but I would kind of like it to work for constant. Um, I also maybe don't want to overwrite the original uh, variable. I don't want to modify the string in place. So here is an example. Here is attempt number one at allocating a new string and writing our characters to it. What's the problem? Well, we see right there, we did not initialize that pointer. Now we've gone over the initializing of the pointer, the uninitialized pointer a couple of times already. Maybe we can start to expect what's happening here. Um, but you know, I did a lot of it on the slides. I want to actually show you what that looks like in reality um, and, and how we might drill down into this. One thing I do want to note about lowercase two that is different about lowercase one is notice the for loop. We're not going I less than Sterlin anymore. We're going less than or equal. Can anyone maybe explain why? Anyone have insight for why now that we are copying the string out, we need to go less than or equal? We need a zero. What's that? We need to copy zero as well. We need to copy the, yeah, the null terminator, exactly. So, in a, so imagine I'm working with the string Leland, which has Sterlin of six, then I would like to copy the L-E-A-L-A-N-D, and then there is this other the, the, term, the null terminator in my string, the backslash zero, which indicates that the, that the string is, you know, that we've reached the end of the string. We need to remember to copy that as well. So a very easy mistake to forget this kind of off by one, um, stir line off by one errors in our for loop or later you'll see in our allocations. Watch for that. So in this case, less than or equal. Okay. Uh, so what's going to happen? Well, I won't, I won't, uh, I won't build suspense for too much longer since we did, ha we have already seen this. I did change to lowercase two, so that's nice. Okay, we even get the warning. So now I'll point out the warning that hey, copy is used uninitialized. Uh, you know, totally unequivocal message here that this is definitely not going to work out. We can run, see stir. We seg fault. Not too surprising, right? Uninitialized variable, garbage memory. You know, been there. Uh oh. Typo. I can run it, and I can see that I'm kind of stuck in here uh, in just trying to work with Leland. And um, I can print out i, and we can see that, that we weren't even able to assign copy i equals to lower of stir i. Uh, a quick note about working with GDB here uh, is that you might think, oh, well, I wonder what copy is actually right now. And you might try to print out copy. And you'll get this kind of annoying message that says that the value is optimized out. That has to do with how we are compiling our, our programs this quarter. Um, the, the general rule of thumb I can give you here is that if the compiler prints out a warning, especially, that, hey, you're doing something wrong, then there's also kind of a good chance that, that GDB might not be able to follow through on everything that you try to print out. Because once the compiler realizes that that variable is uninitialized, it kind of gets to do whatever it wants. But let's say you, you couldn't tell. Let's say you had no idea that the variable is uninitialized. You're still not seeing it. You have this big block of code. Um, and you know, and now we're getting this optimized out message. What in the world we do? What do we do? Well, when it comes to memory issues, when it comes to something like a seg fault or just ra crazy, you know, random garbage being printed out or anything that suggests that it might be memory related, another really awesome tool that we can use is Valgrind. And you've already played with Valgrind in assignment zero, but now we're using it, looking at it on the. Well, I can't type today. On the uh, the developer side, on the programmer side. So I'll run valgrind dot slash cster. And here we get the error that we expect. It actually, valgrind itself actually tells us that the program is going to seg fault. But here we get a very nice message 
So I'll walk you through this report, and um, we'll show a couple more um, just to make sure we're all kind of on the same page of how Valgrind reports are read. Valgrind tells us that we have an invalid write of size 1. So we tried to write on line 32, we tried to write something. Let me look at 32 real quick. On line 32, we tried to write to copy bracket i. Right. So we have an invalid write of size 1. Now, where what were we trying to write to? We were trying to write to address 0x0. Zero zero. You'll start to recognize 0x0 zero zero as being null. Did it have to be null? No, of course not. It was uninitialized. It could have been, it could have been any variable or any address, but it happened to be 0x0. Zero zero, and Valgrind conveniently tells us that, hey, guess what? 0x0 zero zero isn't allocated anywhere, so that's just not going to work out. And therefore, the program would segfault. Questions about Valgrind message, lowercase two? <coughs> so, okay, I guess it's pretty, pretty obvious that, hey, I have an uninitialized variable. We've done it a few times. We're just going to keep harping on the same point that uninitialized variable bad. Um, all right. Let's go to lowercase three. Yep, go for it. Initialize the variable if we didn't want to fill it with a value. If we didn't want to <coughs> fill it with a specific value. Uh, what do you mean by filling it with a specific value? Like you're saying, you're saying, for lowercase 2, we've got copy, right? And our goal is to make a copy of the string. Oops. Spoilers, I guess. Our goal is to make a copy of that string. Unfortunately, here we've only declared a pointer. We haven't allocated any memory for the copy of that string. So, we're going to need to allocate memory somehow. Either that's going to come on the stack or it's going to come on the heap. But or I, I guess I could, you know, or I could initialize this pointer to, to something else. But if my intention was to actually make a new copy of the string, then that's going to have to come from some kind of an allocation. I'm going to need to use a stack array. I'm going to need to use a heap array. And we'll see both of those in the next couple examples. Is that OK? Yep. Are ah, yes. So it was briefly mentioned in the comment, but essentially what we are saying from pretty much from here on out is that we would like, is that we are basically promising the caller of our function that we will not be changing the characters in str. So by saying const char star, this is a pretty minor thing. We're not going to make a big deal out of it, but every so often you'll see a warning that tells you that you're discarding const, which basically means that if your function has no intention of changing the characters in str, you should declare str to be const char star to say, I will not change it. Don't worry. You can, you can pass me a constant. Does that make sense? Yep, cool. Anything else? Um, uh, but isn't that kind of redundant? Uh, like, is there any reason why you have to do that? Because it seems like it's already static, right? You can't change it. Uh, what do you mean by static? Well, uh, like the example we saw, you can't change the char star. Oh, you're thinking about the variable constant? Yeah. So, yeah, I should be clear that um, I could, OK, so first of all, yes, uh, for a string constant, for an actual string constant, Putting const will help, will get the compiler to help us out. I won't do it because it'll generate some warnings, but if I actually wrote const in here, then it'll get the compiler's attention when I try to pass something like constant to lowercase one, which actually does try to change the characters. Then rather than seg faulting, the compiler will say, uh uh uh, you passed me a const char star, and you meant to, and, and this function wants a char star and wants to change it. Happens to just be a warning, but eh, it's better nothing. Um, the other aspect is that const applies not just to these string literals. It applies not just to junior. So in this case, we're passing stack and heap also as const char star, which is merely telling us as we write main that lowercase 2 will not change the characters in stack, and it will not change the characters in heap. So the const is still relevant for just kind of the, the almost the documentation purposes of saying that we won't change that. Okay. Anything else? Good stuff. All right. Let's go to lowercase three. And then, by the way, I'm using control V for visual mode uh, or rec. 
Yeah. I think I must have missed something. Why did you take away the const in front of um, care? Const? Oh, uh, it wasn't there before. And I added it sort of to make a point. But I guess the problem is, OK, I could put it in. And maybe I will. Um, the problem is I haven't, oops. Oh, no, I messed up. Sorry. Um, I, if I put the const, there are a couple of functions. There are a couple of lowercase functions that do want to change the characters. And if I put the const there, then I'll start getting warnings that say, uh, -uh you have got a const there. Um, so I'm not going to put it in just so I don't get flooded with warnings, but you are welcome to try it just to see what the warnings look like because I, uh, there's a really good chance you will run into them on at least one of your assignments. Um, so just, just, just a heads up about the const. Yep. For lowercase one, the return was redundant because for lowercase one, you'll notice that all we did was return str. And str was just the thing that was passed in. So we're returning exactly the same pointer as we, as we took in. We saw when we ran it, and I, I guess I've changed it a little too much by now, but we saw when we ran it that stack and result one were both the lowercase string. That heap and result two were both the lowercase string. So in that case, we didn't really need to look at the return value since this function, lowercase one, was just going to change the characters directly inside of str anyway. Right? But for lowercase two and onward, it is no longer redundant. It now does matter because we are returning a copy. Is that okay? Everybody, everybody else good? Anything else? Cool. So let's go to lowercase three. Here I have declared, so this is one of the uh, few ways I could allocate memory for my copy. So I realized, uh-oh, uninitialized pointer, bad news. OK, sounds good. Well, Michael said whenever there was, whenever I could use the stack, I should use the stack. So here we go. I'll declare this uh, copy to be a variable on the stack, a, an array on the stack. I've allocated it to be strlen plus 1 to have enough space. And I've copied all the characters into it. All that should be super legit. But what happens when I return? What happens to this variable? Well, the array goes, goes away, quote unquote. But what does that mean? Let's, uh, let, me, let, let me turn this into kind of an interactive thing. Let's take a, a, just maybe a minute, I don't know, talk to the person next to you if, if you can. I guess you're all kind of spread out. But talk to the person next to you. What do you think is going to happen? If you are going along, don't run it. You know, just make a prediction first. And then if you want to run it, because you can't, you can't hold your suspense for that long, that's fine. But make a prediction first. What's going to happen? We take 10 more seconds. <laughs> wow, you guys stopped yourself at 10 seconds. That's amazing. OK, let's, uh, let's regroup. That was pretty awesome, actually. But most of you did actually stop yourself with 10 seconds ago. That's cool, cool, good times. Any, uh, any, any suggestions? What's going to happen? Uh, uh, I think it's going to work. Um, could it be because you're... Oh, okay. sorry. Okay, so you're saying you think it will work? Go, go ahead. I think, it's, I think it's probably going to work because nothing will have actually overridden the information that we stored the stack variable in. Okay, so you think it's going to... Yeah. It 
we got lucky on that. Like, it's going to make more changes. So, so you're saying you think it's going to work just basically by sheer luck. Great. OK. I'll show you this bottom one. OK, there was somebody back there. I'm good. Oh, OK. Anything else? Any other predictions? You don't think it's going to work. What do you think is going to happen? I don't think we're going to be lucky enough for that stack. OK, OK. So you, you, just, you just don't think it's gonna, you, we're going to get lucky. You think maybe it could have worked, but nope. But no deal? OK. Anything else? Sure. Sorry, say that again. Oh, yeah, uh-huh. Yes. Ah. Ah, good, good. So, so we're returning a care array, but we, you, you're saying we, we return a, we're returning a care array, but we promise to return a care star. Uh, arrays and pointers kind of work the same way, and even though this array is on the stack, it actually still works like a pointer anyway. So we're actually, yeah, so that's a good question. We're actually not going to get any kind of warnings, or, or we're not going to get a, a type mismatch on that. Um, we can treat this care array as if it were a care star. And therefore, we can return it that way. Is that okay? So you're saying it's going to, well, so it's the, it, it's, uh, yes, we're returning a pointer to the first character of the string, but we always, that's always what a string is, right? A care star is always a pointer to the first character. And I mean, so I guess it was kind of printing that out before, but okay, so, so, um, yeah, so it's possible that something weird will happen when we try to assign the values, and then maybe we lose some characters, or it's just like we only manage to keep one of them. But um, but certainly in terms of the actual printing, um, we will print out the entire. We'll print out as many characters as we can read from that care star because we are because that's what printf with percent s means is we're just going to go um, go until we reach the null terminator. Any other predictions? So since since our our printing is being done in main, yep. and our function yep. uh, lowercase three, yep. returns, if the the yep. array was allocated in the stack, yep. when it when it when the function ends, is it gonna die? Like would that stack memory part just die? Yeah. And then result three will be when we point into nothing. So when we print, I think it's going to print whatever the dead part of stuff. Okay. I, yeah. So, so, the, so your comment is that um, you think that once the once the function returns, the memory is just kind of gone. So it will be pointing to some memory that's that's maybe not valid or something. But I, I, part of the question is, so what, what do you think is going to be in that memory? Are you saying like we have no idea? Is it just going to be garbage? Okay. So you're thinking maybe it's going to be garbage? Okay. Great. All right. Let me just run it. I did change it. Right. So we're all good. I'll go over here. I'll remember to make. Uh, no, we do get the warning. Uh, this is an opportunity to draw your attention to the warning. I'm not fixing them deliberately in, in our examples, but we do get a warning that says, hey, gosh, you're returning the address on a local variable. That seems kind of weird. I don't think that's going to work the way you want it to. Huh. This is pretty interesting, right? So we've got result one is junior, result two is junior, result three is junior. Huh. Okay. Time for some GDB, right? Let's run. Okay. So now, if I just run, of course, it's just going to go all the way through. There was no seg fault. There was no crash. Didn't turn out to be garbage, even. So now I'm going to need to put a breakpoint. Uh, and so where shall I put a breakpoint? Well, let me take a quick look at my code. I'll go ahead and put a breakpoint on this line, which is going to be 106. Now, just a quick note about GDB debugging, something that maybe might caught you, catch you off guard. When you see a line in GDB that says 106, blah, 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 this line has not executed yet. So I cannot look at what is in result one. Um, it has not been initialized. Only after I go next will it run that particular line. OK? So let's just go ahead and try and print out result one. Huh. It worked, right? Uh, it seems fine. Leland, yeah, OK. All right, cool. Let's go next. Print out result two. Oh, that seemed to work too. How nice. 
So I don't know, was printf just freaking out? Uh, print result one again. And now we see the problem. And here, in fact, so the way this output goes is that this number is the address. Remember, result one, result two, and result three are all care stars, so they're pointers to characters. This is the address that's actually, you know, from the diagram in the box of the pointer. Notice they are exactly the same. So I think you were all on the right track when looking at that stack memory and saying, hey, it's going to be deallocated. I won't go all the way through because you can predict what's going to happen with the next one, but um, we already saw what's going to happen. You were all pretty much on the right track with this idea that this memory, the memory for copy, will be deallocated at the end of this function. Um, or I'm sorry, it will be, it won't be, you know, technically our memory anymore. But what does that mean for the actual memory? Does it get zeroed out? No. Does it magically turn into garbage? No. Are we getting lucky that it's still kind of containing stuff? I mean, kind of? Like, certainly, if we did add more stuff to this program, we might not even be able to get the Leland and the Stanford uh, after a couple more calls. But the issue is that, so imagine, you know, I'm maybe going to have to just kind of gesture about this. So imagine we've got this function, you know, lowercase three, and it's got some space for the array. And we call it with Leland. And it says, OK, I'll fill that array with the, with the, with the lowercase string Leland. Then function goes away, lowercase returns. We say, great, you don't need this memory anymore. Now we call lowercase three with Stanford. You start up lowercase three, and it says, hey, I need some memory. Where do you think it's going to get the memory? Well, probably from the same place, because that old memory wasn't being used anymore, because it's not valid memory anymore. So here, have that memory again. Right? But now we still kept a pointer in main, namely result one, was pointing to that copy, and the contents of that copy has now changed. Question. Yep. So it sounds like if we'd run it once, it would have worked. Like if we had just run it one time, that memory, yep. like you said, it yep. would have been yep. not safe, but yep. the stuff would still be there. Yes. But if we ran a different function, uh -huh. would it go back to that memory and rewrite that? Or depending on where you are in the code, would it go to different places? Ah, great. Yeah, so you're saying, OK, so if I ran this thing on only one variable, let's say on only stack, it'll work. You're right. But then if we did something between calling lowercase 3 and the printf, we called some other function that also had an array, then it is very much possible, and in fact extremely likely, that that other function will use exactly that same space that we are using for copy. And so then when you go and print out uh, the, the copy, or when you go and print out result one, it'll still not work. So yes, we are, we are extremely fragile here. The fact that we're getting any result at all that is useful is extremely dependent on the particular order of, of calls. Using the same address for all three of them. Um, is it a coincidence? We'll find out in five weeks that the answer is absolutely not. Um, it is because this this function happens to know exactly how much memory it wants to allocate, and it will always allocate that same amount of memory. And si and since all of all three calls are happening in main, um, just that the whole call sequence looks so similar that they they just inevitably line up. But um, so I mean, it's not, it's not, I, I, I guess it's not coincidental in the sense that it's absolutely possible that um, with a couple of different calls from a couple of, you know, for example, if I were using, sorry, I, I lost my chance. Um, it's, so for this set of calls, for this kind of method, we're not getting lucky that the machine happened to lay it out in that way. Um, we can actually look at the code and see it being laid out. Um, over each other. Sorry, does that make sense? Yeah. Totally got lost there. I'm sorry. Uh, anything else? OK. So, all right. This is a classic case of not being able to use the stack, right? We see that we cannot return a 
pointer to our stack allocated memory. And in particular, the, the key point from the slide at the beginning for why we need to use the heap is that we need to control when this memory is allocated and deallocated, or specifically deallocated. So guess we got to use the heap. <coughs> All right, fine. Here's our care star copy. We'll malloc it. We'll copy stuff in. And we'll return it. Little bug here. We forgot the plus one on the sterlen. Very, very common bug. Notice up here we got sterlen plus one when we allocated the array on the stack. Down here we do not. Um, we do not say uh, sterlen plus one. So okay, another minute. Make a prediction. What's going to happen? And then we'll throw in something else with that, which is all right. What's going to? What is it actually going to print out? And then uh, you know is. Are we like, yeah, so and if you think it works or if you think it doesn't work, like, are, how are we going to find this error? Dr. Neighbor, take a minute. I'll come back to this code, but I'm just going to go down real quick and change these. Maybe five more seconds, ten more seconds. All righty. All righty. Let's, let's come back here. Okay, what do we think? What is going to happen when, when we do this? Okay. Okay. So, so you're thinking in terms of Valgrind? Yeah. There? Yeah, that, that Valgrind maybe starts looking at like an invalid write. Okay. What do you think the program's actually going to do? Uh, I think maybe it'll get the first one right, but I'm not sure what it'll do. Okay. So, you're, so you're thinking maybe it's just going to mess up somewhere when the control terminal doesn't go down? Let me try to write that. Yep. Yeah. Certainly a certain element of unpredictability here. Any other guesses? I have an idea. Yep. So, uh, it'll re do all the like writing into the copied arrays uh -huh. correctly, uh -huh. and it won't. You won't get like overlap errors, but when you get to the printf function, uh -huh. it'll try to read them. It'll do the first. It'll read the characters that you allocated correctly, but then it, since there's no null terminator, it'll go beyond that and we'll try to read random memory. Okay, so you're, yeah, so that's, a, that's, that's neat. So it's like, so you're saying, okay, it's going to print out the characters. Those are fine because the, the memory was allocated for those correctly, but then maybe the, something's going to happen to that null terminator, and if we lose the null terminator, then printf will just keep going, and it'll keep printing out garbage. Okay, neat. Anything else? Anyone want to guess that it's just going to work? Anyone ran it and thought that it actually worked? Uh, I think because the for loop actually goes until uh, less than or equal to. Uh huh. Two length, yep. I think it's just going to go over one array off of copy and yes. copy the null yes. uh, uh, terminator. Yep. But then, because results, the the once you return it, the pointer that receives copy is not going to know how many uh, cells copy was supposed to be anyway. So it's just going to. Read until the null terminator. Yep. And 
So you're thinking, so you're saying, well, it's going to copy the null terminator. Right. And so when we return result, I mean, printf is just going to keep reading from the null terminator. We right. sure did copy one there, and you think it's going to work? I mean, does it bother you that you went off one, one off the end? So you could have like deleted something critical, yeah. but if it couldn't, then... But if we didn't, then we got lucky. So you're saying, oh, you know, it's possible that that zero was like some super important, you know, piece of memory that we just overwrote. If it wasn't, then maybe we get away with it. Cool, great. Uh, let's try it. Uh, I will actually get out of, where am I? Oh, I will get out of GDB, because I don't think I need it here. We'll make, okay, and we'll run it. Works, worked great. Neat, okay, we're done. It's fine, wrote out one off the end, who cares? No, let's not do that. All right, so we are not seeing the symptom. We're not seeing any issue, any bug here. We know that there's some memory issue going on there, and we're not seeing it. And exactly, we we wrote this, we did write the null terminator. It, like, we are absolutely writing that null terminator to one off the end of this allocated array. And the write went through. There is certainly a chance that the write won't go through. That there wasn't actually any memory at that point, and therefore we would seg fault or something. That's just not, that's pretty rare that going one off the end will really cause that problem, but sometimes it'll happen. Uh, you do this a few thousand times with a few different strings, a few thousand different strings, it'll, you'll definitely hit it once. But in this case, we got lucky, wrote a null terminator to, I hope you didn't need that memory, and now we're, we're able to get away with it on the terminal. Let's see what Valgrind has to say in response to us just trampling over random memory in the heap. And sure enough, we've got lots of errors. We also get leaks. I'll get back to the leaks. Um, of course, the errors are a lot more important than memory leaks when we look at Valgrind. So, you know, certainly if you see these errors, don't think, oh, well, I also have leaks. Maybe I should fix the leaks first. No, no. Let's look at these errors and try to understand them first. And sure enough, we see, I'll go all the way to the top. And sure enough, we do see this invalid write of size one. Where is it? It's in lowercase.c. You can bet that's the copy bracket i line. Here's the part that is actually super, super useful that Valgrind can give us, that even something like GDB um, will not. Valgrind is telling us, you made an invalid write of size one, which means one character. Where did you try to write to? You tried to write to this address. Well, I don't know what that address means, but that address is zero bytes after a block of size six allocated. This bottom section is telling us where that memory was allocated. So it's saying the memory was allocated by a call to malloc, which happened in lowercase four. So how do we interpret this whole thing? We tried to write to some memory. The memory, there was a block of memory that was allocated in lowercase four using malloc to be size six. That makes sense. That's L E A N D or L E L A N D. And you wrote zero bytes after it, meaning immediately after it. So we get this memory error. It tells us, um, and and Valgrind won't let us get away with it, which is really really darn nice because uh, now we can fix this issue. We can make sure that our our code runs cleanly, and we will not accidentally trip that random seg fault in a few thousand cases. Question. Yep. What do you mean by you have bytes after it? Um, mean, is that the null terminator? No, terminator? that's a good oh, question. Okay. Yeah, the zero bytes does not mean the null terminator. What we're saying is this is how far after the block of six. So if I have a block of six and then I've got, and let's say I, I you know, so after the block of six, I skip four and I write over here, then it'll say you went four bytes after the block of six. Does that make sense? Yeah. But I wrote immediately after the block of six, so I'm zero bytes after this block. Why not one byte after the block of six? Because we count from zero, I guess? Yeah, there's not a good, it, it, I, yeah, maybe you do want to think, hey, it feels like this is a byte after. Yeah, you'll just have to maybe get used to the, the way the numbering kind of works out, that zero bytes after means immediately after. But that's great, great question. Anything else? Uh, yep. Yeah. 
through an allocated block, yep. um, can that be overridden so that like part of it is erased but the rest is still there? It's possible. Um, okay. As you get more and more, com so so the question is, can is it can it be erased or like can something weird happen where like part of the memory is still there and part of it's not? Yeah, like absolutely anything can happen when you write out of bounds, right? Um, if, for example, I called malloc again after I, you know, kept doing these writes one or two or three bytes after, and I just kept calling malloc and then writing after, out of bounds, I'm probably going to crash malloc eventually. Um, eventually, I'll, I'll stomp over something that malloc was using, and I'll be like, uh, yeah, yeah, that, you know, buck stops here. Like, you're going to seg fault, you're going to get some crazy error message. Um, so, yes. Um, all variety of things can happen with these array out of bounds, which is why Valgrind is so helpful. Because you might run your program and you might see either no output or you might see some complete garbage. It, like, so that example of the, or so the, the suggestion of the printf with garbage coming out after the, the string, that's also possible. Um, and how would you even debug that? What do you do when you see Leland, right? Like, what does this even mean? Well, Valgrind, Valgrind will tell you. An alternator, then what would happen when the program tries to read that? So, if it's, so you're saying if, if the string just happens to be a single alternator? Yeah, well, like then, yeah, so in that example where, where the null terminator gets overwritten by something else, then, well, all string functions, including printf, right, are just going to, I mean, they don't know how long the string is. Otherwise, they're just going to keep reading characters and printing them out until they hit a null, which, or a null terminator. So they're just going to keep going until they see a backslash zero. Where are we going to see a backslash zero? Well, we sure hope there is one in memory somewhere to stop us eventually, and there probably is. Backslash zero happens to be the integer zero, and, and we'll see that later. So there are zeros all over the memory. So we'll stop eventually. How do they know to stop um, printing if we never actually put a backslash zero? The thing is, we did put a backslash zero in the for loop. So the for loop did go from i less than or equal to sterlen. So this very last iteration of the loop where i, in the case of Leland, where i equals equals 6, we're copying um, str bracket i. So str bracket 6, when the str is Leland, is going to be the backslash 0. Uh, calling two lower on backslash 0 gives us backslash 0. So we will write the backslash 0 to copy. It's just that we're writing it out of bounds, and it's happening not to get overwritten. That's correct. Yeah, I mean, print doesn't know the end, right? Like, this code doesn't know the end. We can't just look at this code, like, from this line and see that we went out of bounds, right? Neither can print. It's just going to keep reading from your pointer, because that's what you told it to do. Since we have a backslash zero, zero in this case, will it ever crash if you keep running it? Like, this is already there. The risk for the crash, so the question is, will it ever crash? The risk for the crash is if uh, copy bracket 6 happened to not have any memory associated with it. We haven't hit the very, very end of our heap. Then it might crash um, in the write. But the print will never crash, assuming that the write works. Uh, size of care? Is that just because care is by size? Ah, good question. Oh, you're asking why for malloc are we not using size of care when all the other mallocs I was using size of something? Care in C is defined to always have size 1. Size of care will always, always, always be the value 1. Therefore, it's largely redundant to write time size of care here, and so we're just going to leave it off when allocating character arrays, uh, but not for any other array. You already ran this, yep. and so it wrote the null terminator at that point in memory. Yep. Now, if you quit this program and you run it again without the for, like, if you change the for loop to make it just less than, yeah. so it doesn't write the null terminator, yeah. it, we were just talking about, like, oh, well, it can just keep reading. Yeah. But if you've already run the program and put a null, like, oh, yeah. does it remember that kind no. of memory? Yeah, yeah. So the question is, will, will the state of memory be kind of preserved across runs? And the answer is no. Every time I rerun the program, like, the memory gets initialized from scratch again. Anything else? OK. Um, there are memory leaks here. Uh, so I could fix this, but I'd rather actually, uh, I could fix the, the plus one here. Um, you'll see that in lowercase five. I want to 
but I want to do something a little bit different. Um, so I'll leave that. I'll leave that as a bit of an exercise. I mean, you should add the plus one. There are also leaks here for freeing the result variables. Again, these aren't super like mission critical to fix, but they certainly would be good to fix. So I will also leave that as something for you to try out. Um, maybe I'll make a separate commit to the lecture code showing you how to free all the memory um, if, if, I, if I get a chance. But I want to switch gears a little bit um, and talk about a different way that we could do this, uh, a different way we could do this. And I want to do, do that in slides. OK. So let me, let me talk you through, actually, I should show you the code. Sorry, let me. <laughs> I should show you the code for what I'm going to try to do in slides, and then I'm going to and then I'm going to move away from code for a second. So here's lowercase five. You can see that we did fix the plus one here, and everything else about this code is fine except I'm going to focus on this line for the next like 15 minutes, which is that what in addition to making this copy of memory in the heap and writing it and returning it. So this function will totally work to that extent. It will, if we got rid of this line, like the function will behave as expected. It will give us the result values uh, that have the lowercase and, and they will be correctly allocated. We won't have any memory errors. We will still have some leaks that we should clean up. But I want to focus on this, which is maybe what we actually want to do is go back and set str, the parameter that we received, to actually point to the copy as well. So that, for example, when we go back into main, our variable heap and our variable constant are actually also pointing at the new lowercase string. Okay? So, uh, I guess uh, I'll spoil it for you now, but you can run it on your own if you'd like. It's not going to work that way. And I'd like to actually draw out why it won't work that way. Uh, the first thing I need to do is skip a bunch of slides because I have an example in here, a worked example of lowercase one. I was using it as comparison, but seeing as, um, you know, uh, so feel free to go back to the slides. Again, I will post these. I'll try to remember to post these right after lecture. Um, I, have a, I have a worked example of how lowercase one updates memory, uh, but I'll, I'll, I'll jump straight to lowercase five. So here we have the code. I am not having this function return the care star in this situation um, because I don't care about that part. I am more interested in this update line. I'm more interested in trying to make stir equals copy. And I would like to have, so here you can see the memory diagram. Hopefully the, the pattern looks somewhat familiar from Monday. Here, this is the, the local variable for main. I'm only doing heap because it's just going to keep things simpler. And what I would actually like to do is I'd like when this call to lowercase five returns that heap will be not will not be pointing at this Stanford string, but will be pointing at a lowercase version of that. Does that make sense? Questions about diagramy things? I just kind of jumped into here. Okay. So we'll walk through it. The line in blue is the line that I'm currently talking about. Whether it's I'm not super consistent about whether it's happening before or after. But anyway, so here I've started to enter the lowercase five function. And inside lowercase five, we take the parameter str. And in main, we pass heap. So what does that mean? Well, it means we look inside the box for heap and we copy it down to the, to the variable str. So we've got both str and heap pointing at the same block of memory here. OK, so then I allocate this copy of var variable. I, I have a couple slides to do this. OK, so then I've allocated this copy variable um, with a malloc. Here's the memory for that. The, the copying of the for loop should be OK, right? We go through and we start filling it. Oops, we start filling it. Everybody OK up to this point? So we've, we've gone through the entire for loop. We have this copy variable that is pointing at this new block of memory, uh, which now stores the lowercase value. Everybody okay up to this point? Questions? 
feel like I'm going a little fast, but okay. Now we get to stir equals copy. What does this do? Well, there's no dereference. This is exactly like the exercises we were doing on Monday. Stir equals copy means that we look at stir. We look at, we, sorry, we start at copy. We look at copy. We say, what's in the box? 2050. Okay, take the 2050, stick it in that box. All right. So now stir and copy are both pointing at this new string. But oh shoot, what happens when we return? They're gone. And heap did not change. So this is not a successful way to, to update the pointer heap. Questions about lowercase five? Ah, good question. So will it, will it, will, well, so will there be an error or will anything go wrong because we didn't free the memory? You can clearly see it right there. Oh my gosh, it's not freed. That's a memory leak. So yes, Valgrind will tell us that there is a leak. That's, that's a bummer. It's especially a bummer because we didn't even use this memory. But it's not going to crash. It's not going to be a memory error. It's just going to, Valgrind just be like, hey, hey, by the way, didn't free the memory. By the way. Other questions? Maybe run through it one more time because the, the fact that there is a variable named heap confused me for a second. Oh, sorry. Okay. Yeah, sorry. So here, let me go back. Do, do, do. Here, I'm going to start from just kind of around here. Is that okay? Um, so I've got this variable called heap. Yeah, uh, yeah, okay. Sorry about that. Um, so I've got this. So <laughs> this is a local variable. Heap is a local variable in main which is pointing at this heap copy of the string Stanford, right? And then now I've got these two variables in lowercase five, str and copy. And here I have str pointing to the same block of memory that this other, this variable up here is pointing to. And copy is pointing to this new one. Okay? So the filling in of the for loop shouldn't not be super surprising how that, how that goes down. We, you know, go into str bracket i, so that means follow this pointer from str into this block, and then we start, we go too lower and we copy it down here. And then when I get to str equals copy, um, we're really only looking at these two variables down here, where I make str point to where copy is point, uh, point to where copy is, is pointing, so they go down there. But then that has no effect once I've returned. This local variable is heap, called heap uh, is still pointing at the original string. Okay. All right. Let me show you how to fix this. We already talked about the case of passing an int by reference by adding a star. And you might think, well, hey, this is already a care star. I already have my stars. I shouldn't need to add any more stars. I shouldn't need to, you know, do anything special now. Can't I just pass by reference? And that's part of the reason that I have the, the diagram for lowercase one as a comparison to this, this next one. So, so check that out if you get a chance. But here, um, I'm going to go to lowercase six. This is in the, in the code, and, and like I said, the slides are up. But what we need to do in order to make this work is we need to pass a pointer to, what we want to have happen is we want this box to be changed, right? What we wanted was we wanted this box to point to 2050. Yeah? So in order to change this box, in order to change this variable, we need to pass the address of this variable. Which is why down here in lowercase six, we pass the address of the heap variable. So what does that look like? Up here, we enter lowercase six. We, I, I have a slightly different name for it because I want to remind myself that this is a care double star and not a care star. It's stir p, and what stir p is going to do is it's going to be assigned the value ampersand of heap. So what is the address that this box is located at? Well, it is 9100, right? 
So we'll stick 9100 in this box and draw the arrow. Now do you see the care double star? We've got, we start in this box, we can follow the arrow up to here to get to our care star, and then we can follow another arrow coming out of that to get to our actual characters. Okay? Questions? All right. So now I do the copy part. That's all the same. I, f I fill in Stanford. You'll notice that I have to remember to keep dereferencing stir p throughout my entire block of code. So just watch that. Because now I can't just use stir p as a pointer to some characters. It's not. This thing is not pointing to this. I have to follow that arrow at least once, and then I can use the bracket notation to read stuff out of this array. Okay, so now what happens? Now I've got star stir p equals copy. And so what we do is, okay, let's, let's walk through this uh, just like we did for on Monday. The right hand side is copy. What is copy? It's the value 2050. Okay? It's pointing at this thing. So I take this 2050, uh, don't follow any arrows because there's no star on the right hand side. I take this 2050, and where do I put it? Well, I put it in star stir p, okay? So I start at stir p. I follow the arrow one time because there is a dereference, and I put the 2050 here. So now that this local variable in main points to the new memory. So when this stuff goes away after the function returns, we have successfully updated the variable. Questions? What do you mean by aliasing P? Uh, no, so you're asking if we can put, you cannot put an ampersand up here in a parameter line. That's only C++. We need to use care star star. Anything else? In lowercase five, if I say, ah, good question. If I say lower, in lowercase five, star str equals, I won't go back to the slide, I'm sorry. But uh, star str equals star copy. We want to be very careful what the two types are. Star copy, uh, here you can see well, at least that copy is a care star. So star copy is a single character, right? str in lowercase five was also a care star. So star str is also a single character. So star str equals star copy will only copy one character. Okay, couple things before we, we, we go. Let me, let me get your attention for just a little bit, a little bit longer. This function will largely work up until this point. There is a problem, which is that we did not free this memory. There is a bigger problem, which I will, I will put in the repo, which is that you cannot do this line, ampersand of a variable on a stack array. Just maybe write this down or something. We'll come back to it in lab. You cannot take ampersand of a stack array. Ampersand stack does not give us a care star star. So there is no way to get lowercase six to work with stack. We can only get it to work with heap and with constant. So general conclusion, there is no good lowercase function that will solve all of our problems. Lowercase one almost totally worked. A variant of lowercase you know, four or five kind of between there would have sort of worked for making a new copy. Lowercase six might make sense if we know exactly where our memory is, is coming from and we know that we can take ampersand of it and that we know that we want to change the pointer. But, um, but that's sort of, you know, that's kind of the nature of it in C. Hopefully you got some experience with GDB, you got some stuff with more pointers. We'll come back to all of this stuff next week and again in lab. Uh, until then, we'll see you on Monday. <laughs>